So the agenda we're going to take you through here today uh, is really about kind of exploring key resource uh, dimensions and some tips and tricks for each of them. What we hope you'll take away from today is that performance is not a barrier to virtualization. You can virtualize the largest of your workloads. I'll say we have 99.99% viability. And when we look at the I.O. stacks here, most interesting is obviously the disk. We did some testing. We kind of set the bar and said, can we achieve a million I.O.s out of a single ESX host? And I always like to pull everybody back to kind of the simple architecture picture for a second, which is... It always boils down to the four resource dimensions. CPU, memory, network, and storage. So let's talk about compute. What's important in the compute resource dimension? And I seem to see this missed quite frequently. And it should be a pretty easy notion, but the latest hardware platforms perform best. It makes a lot of sense. But people say, well, why, Mark? And I'll call out a very important feature that's changed uh, recently. And in the Intel space, it's called EPT. And in the AMD space, it's called RBI. Speaking of the BIOS, you know, let's set the definitive rules for what we want to do and set. So obviously, we respect NUMA. We want NUMA to be on. Uh, we'll talk about the VNUMA feature a little bit later on here. But definitively, we should always have that on. Hyper-threading should always be on. And I'll say for the latest hardware platforms. And this one, uh, power management, I get a lot of questions about. Which is the old power versus performance. Should I enable BIOS power management and you know, spin down my extra cores, change my uh, C states and P states? And I'll say yes as in vSphere 5. So we put a, a little bit more engineering in vSphere 5 for the power management policies, and we like the power management on because we can coordinate that activity much better. For vSphere 4.1 and earlier, I'll actually suggest we should shut off BIOS power management. And what we're finding there is actually an increase in performance because we want to have maximum capability out of those processors. So Mark's rough rule of thumb is anything greater than an 8-way VM, I like to see those land on quad socket platforms. And you know, as core counts change a little bit, the rules will give and take, but I'm about making sure that if you build a big VM, he's probably using a lot of power and we should make sure he's on a powerful platform. So using all of these layered technologies, we can overcommit memory on the hosts very performantly so we still get good economic value, and you know the question of how horribly slow is it? it it's not horribly slow at all. Like I said, they're used on demand, and they're almost immeasurable. It takes a team of people to see this overhead. Like I suggested here, memory speed is relatively insignificant. Now, obviously there are workloads that are sensitive to that. My rule of thumb for everybody is to make sure you have enough memory first versus fast memory. Memory reservations for Tier 1 apps, 100%. So I like the old keep it simple management principle. And keeping it simple and managing your most important tier one workloads means they need memory. Reserve the memory for them and let them run. Let all the rest of the low hanging fruit kind of compete for memory space. But let's not compromise on our large databases or large messaging systems. So network. Remember the old days where we used to blame the network for everything? It's always the network's fault. Oh, that's network. That's not the case in virtualization. Sure, maybe we can still blame the network guys for a lot of stuff, but not in the virtual stack. So depending on how you set your teaming policy, you're either going to use a lot of bandwidth or you're not. So spend a little bit of time there and select the right one, depending on what your network infrastructure guys want to. Network I.O. control. But the value of network I.O. control is arbitrating access to the network uh, bandwidth in and out of the host. So in my mind, when there's a point of contention, you want to protect your most important workloads. And this engine is going to help you do that. Creating separate storage networks. So for those using NFS or iSCSI, uh, I'm a big fan of breaking out those storage networks still. Carry them either on separate VLANs, separate uh, network links. But as you start to combine everything, you know, you have a server with two 10 gate ports on it. And we need to guarantee access to client networks and the storage networks. Network I.O. control is going to help you sort that out. If you have many uplinks, uh, I still tend to break those out. Because what we don't want to do is we don't want to overrun the storage networks. If we take the VMs offline, it doesn't matter how anything performs. So just be careful in the balance of that. vMotion. Everybody loves vMotion. Yay! But as we build these monster VMs, let's do the math. Let's take a one terabyte VM. Let's vMotion them across a one gig link. 
<laughs> Anybody do the math in their heads on that one? It's a long time. So we have to be cognizant that as we build larger VMs, we're adding more bandwidth to these hosts so that we can keep using the cool feature like Emotion. So my kind of you know, rule of thumb here again is, you know, monster VMs, 10 gig infrastructure. It's great for bandwidth, but the trade-off is latency. So the packets may not arrive as quick. And so if you have applications that are very latency sensitive, for instance, VoIP type applications, you know, financial trading where microseconds count, you might want to disable interrupt coalescing. And my favorite, storage. So I'll say in my performance experience, uh, covering primarily North America for the last number of years, storage is the one that bubbles up to the top and is trouble for most. 99 out of 100 times when somebody reports a performance problem to me, that it's storage related. And it's because the stack can be relatively complex, right? When we take disks at the bottom and we start to aggregate them together into RAID groups, stripe them to LUNs, and then we hand up those LUNs and we put a file system on them. Then we build a VM and we put a file system inside a VMDK and we layer that on top. It starts to get cloudy. I had to use cloud differently than everybody else at the conference. So let's dive into this storage stack <coughs> kind of deeper. So what's important to it? I want everybody in this room to take away two counters today for troubleshooting. These are the two most important counters. On the diagram, they're designated K and D. K is your kernel average latency. That's the amount of time an I.O. takes to pass through the hypervisor. So you want to know what your storage overhead is? There's a counter right there. Now, typically, K average happens in tens of microseconds. So uh, I'll, on the next slide, I'll kind of put a threshold down here, but Bad K average means ESX host problem. Probably contention, probably out of CPU. D, on the other hand, is your device average latency. That's the amount of time an I.O. takes leaving the ESX host, going up to your storage frame, and having that acknowledged I.O. come back. So a high D average indicates transport or array problem. So I'll say for D average, device average latency is about 10 to 15 milliseconds is the tipping point. So we talked about the four kind of hardware dimensions of the host. So let's take a look at the guest. So the guest OS we put up there, what do we want to pay attention to? And I'll suggest we want to do some very simple things like let's use the para-virtualized drivers. VMXNet3 should be the default network adapter for almost every workload. And I'll suggest for your biggest workloads, big databases, big messaging, you should be changing to use the PB SCSI driver in those guests. LSI, Logic, SAS, you know, by default for everything else is good. The two of them perform about the same, the two drivers, but PB SCSI is going to do it for less ESX host cost. So we looked at ESX host, we made sure the ESX host is not swapping. But if we undersize that guest VM, there's a chance that operating system is using its swap or page file. And when that happens, same thing, we're going to disk for it, and performance drops off, and it's got nothing to do with virtualization. You know, we might have undersized it, but the VM admins are quickly blamed for it. So let's look inside there. And then last but not least, I mean, application owners have to take some responsibility too. If they're asking for an eight-way VM, they should be able to answer or suggest that yes, their application is using eight threads or the correct number of threads, right? Versus just, I want an eight way because it's cool. <laughs> and then last but not least, what I want to mention before I have Reza come up is that now that we spent this time when we've created a powerful VM on the right platform, we need to manage him appropriately. We want to make sure that the performance you see today is the performance you see tomorrow. And how do we do that? And I'll suggest uh, go and check out some sessions on vCenter operations while you're here.